There is something terrible about to happen and I can prove it to you. In the next few minutes, I will reveal to you a terrifying prophecy linked to the Euphrates River. This prophecy is being hidden on TV and social media, and many powerful people don't want you to know about it. But, this secret will be exposed today. In this video, you will discover who the four terrifying angels trapped in the Euphrates River are and why they are so dangerous that Jesus himself revealed that humanity will not survive them. Stay with me until the end of this video and don't be caught off guard, prepare for what is to come and understand how you can survive this terrible future and remain faithful to God. We will start by talking about something astonishing called, the Great Tribulation, which, according to scriptures, will be the hardest time humanity has ever seen. Just imagine, the Bible is full of predictions about how God will judge the earth during this period. It's kind of like those action movies, you know? One of those tense days is mentioned as the Day of the Lord, which is really something big and serious. In the book of Revelation, they talk about seven trumpets that, when blown, signal different types of divine judgments. When the sixth trumpet sounds, something super specific happens, a mysterious voice commands an angel to release four angels who were bound near the great Euphrates River. And that's when things get really wild because the unleashed forces are much more destructive than before. While the locusts of the fifth trumpet only tormented people, the angels of the sixth trumpet and their armies go even further, they really go into action for total destruction. But why does this happen? Why are these imprisoned angels so dangerous? Well, to understand this, you need to understand how Lucifer's rebellion occurred. The whole thing starts with a super important and, let's be honest, incredibly beautiful angel named Lucifer. He wasn't just any angel, he was one of the top ones, right at the top of the celestial hierarchy. But then, pride hit hard. Lucifer began to think that he could and should be equal to God. Just imagine the level of self-confidence. The ancient texts, especially from the book of Isaiah, paint a vivid picture of this situation. They speak of someone who was once so high and then fell so low. How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, the text says. He really tried, climbing as high as he could, wanting to set his throne above the stars and be equal to the Most High. But, spoiler alert, it didn't end well. He was cast out, thrown down, straight into the abyss. Ezekiel also has a version of this story, talking about a protective cherub, another high angelic position, who was in Eden, surrounded by beauty and perfection. But then, vanity entered the scene. The guy saw how beautiful he was, how wise and everything else, and it got to his head. Again, he wanted more, much more than he should have. And like Isaiah, Ezekiel recounts that this arrogance cost Lucifer dearly. He was cast out from the holy mountain of God, and his fall was a spectacle for all to see. However, Lucifer didn't fall alone. In Revelation 12 verses 3 to 4, 9 it is written that he brought various angels with him, saying, Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on its heads. For its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth, and his angels with him. All these angels who were expelled from heaven in that famous rebellion are now part of a group we call demons, and they are led by none other than Satan, formerly known as Lucifer. Nowadays, it is believed that Satan and his demons have a certain influence over the world. You know, the Apostle Paul once said something profound about this. He said, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. If we stop to think about it, we can see that there is a whole organization behind this, with principalities at the top and then rulers and powers. These demons, though working in different ways, share a common goal, to bring destruction and chaos upon us. Now, the reason we're talking about this today is to make everything clearer for you, especially after mentioning how, somehow, Satan and his followers have a hand in what happens in the world. But listen, there's something very important you need to know, not all these demons are under Satan's orders now. There are some who, because they are extremely powerful and dangerous, have been locked up by God in eternal prisons to cause no more havoc. To give an example, in the book of Jude, chapter 1, verse 6, it talks about this, and the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, 
but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Bible scholars say that these imprisoned demons are even more powerful than the ones who are free, except for Satan himself. They were confined because, if they were free, the world would be an even more chaotic place than it already is. Another mention of these powerful angels who are controlled by God and live imprisoned can be found in Revelation 9 verses 14 to 15, where it is written, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels, who had been prepared for the hour, the day, the month, and the year, were released to kill a third of mankind. This detail is crucial because it shows that these are not ordinary angels, they are rebellious angels, part of Satan's gang that God has imprisoned for a time, but will eventually be released to execute divine judgment. What's interesting is that even these supernatural creatures are under God's control, as they are only released by His command. The Euphrates River plays a super interesting role here. Besides being one of the rivers that flowed through the Garden of Eden, it is also known as the cradle of many ancient religions. This river also marked the eastern boundary of the Promised Land, and beyond it lay the empires of Assyria and Babylon, which historically conquered and ruled over the Israelites. Continuing the story, these four angels were programmed to be released exactly at the right moment, on a specific day, month, and year, to kill a third of the human population. The army they lead is enormous, 200 million cavalry. And the horses they ride? Imagine this, they have armor that seems to be made of fire, sapphire, and sulfur. The heads of these horses are like those of lions, and from their mouths come fire, smoke, and sulfur. These angels will appear on the scene at an exact moment, planned down to the last detail, we're talking about specific year, month, day, and hour, to accomplish something monumental. They will eliminate a third of the world's population. Notice that these angels are not mentioned randomly, they have a very specific role and perfect timing to spring into action. Their description is super detailed, saying that they are prepared for the hour, the day, the month, and the year. This shows how meticulously everything is planned. Well, every detail about hour, day, month, and year suggests that there are no coincidences in what they are destined to do. All this precision underlines that there is a greater plan at work, something like a finely tuned cosmic clock, ensuring that everything happens exactly when it should. And what are these angels going to do? They have a very intense mission, they are released specifically to kill a third of humanity. It's a moment of significant judgment and destruction that marks a crucial point in the final events of the world. Firstly, the role of angels in end-time events serves as a reminder that there are predestined moments for certain actions. They are not simply doing something terrible on impulse, they are fulfilling a part of the divine plan that was marked to happen exactly at that hour, on that day, in that month, and in this year. Fascinating, isn't it? If you're enjoying this content and are a faithful Christian, leave a like on the video and subscribe to the channel to help us share the teachings of Jesus Christ. Continuing. Now, just imagine, it's not possible to know how many people will be around when this happens, because before that, there will have been several catastrophes that will greatly reduce the population. But still, we'll be talking about billions of people. And of these billions, a third will lose their lives because of these four evil angels. To give you an idea, this will make the deaths caused by world wars seem small. But how will these four cause such devastation? They won't be alone, they will lead an army of nothing less than 200 million. The description of these soldiers is out of this world, horses and riders wearing armor that seems to be made of fire, sapphire, and sulfur. The horses have heads resembling lions, and from their mouths come fire, smoke, and sulfur. These three plagues will be responsible for killing a third of the people. And there's more, the horses have tails like living serpents, ready to attack. As for who these 200 million soldiers are, Bible scholars disagree. Some think they are literally armies from some eastern nations, armed to the teeth with the most advanced war technology. Others believe they are, in fact, demons armed to the teeth with extremely lethal weapons. Some people believe that these warriors are not just humans, but humans who have been possessed by demons and are armed to the teeth with weapons capable of mass destruction. The Apostle John gives us a super detailed description of these fighters in his visions. He saw horses and riders with armor shining like fire, made of sapphire and sulfur. 
And it doesn't stop there, the heads of these horses looked like lion heads, and from their mouths came fire, smoke, and sulfur. Thanks to these three plagues, a third of the world's population was decimated. Curiously, the true destructive power was in the horses themselves, not the riders. They had tails that looked like living serpents, ready to attack. John observed that these horses were extremely well protected by their armor, almost immune to any attack. The deadly elements, fire, smoke, and sulfur, that came from the mouths and tails of the horses were responsible for mass destruction. What exactly John was seeing? Well, that's left a bit to our imagination. Some Bible experts think he could be describing something that sounds a lot like nuclear weapons, which this colossal army would use to wreak historical havoc. This series of events we're talking about is undoubtedly the greatest catastrophe the earth has ever seen. Even Jesus mentioned that if those days were not shortened, no one would survive. This is recorded in Matthew, chapter 24, verse 22. If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive, but for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. When Jesus speaks of the elect, he is referring to the people whom God has chosen, who are usually the faithful followers of Christ. The idea of shortening these terrible days is a way for God to show his mercy and protection to these people. The decision to shorten these days is a sign of God's compassion and control over world events. He adjusts the duration of the end-time events to protect his faithful, limiting suffering and preserving their faith. Firstly, God is in control, you know those moments that seem completely out of control? Well, this verse reminds us that, no matter the chaos, God is in control of everything. He can change the course of events whenever necessary to align with his plans. This shows us how powerful he is. Secondly, God protects his own, no matter how dire the situation may seem, God always has a plan to take care of those who are loyal to him. This verse assures us that even in the worst scenarios, if you remain faithful, you can rely on divine protection. Thirdly, there is hope even in the darkest moments, for those who believe, this teaching is a true beacon of hope. It tells us that, regardless of the challenges or adversities, God's promise of salvation and security is always there. This gives us strength to move forward, keeping our faith strong, knowing that we are safe in his hands. To understand better, let's look at what John reveals about the people who managed to survive these devastating attacks. In the book of Revelation, chapter 9, verse 20, he tells us that even after escaping these terrible plagues, many do not repent of their actions. They continue to worship demons and idols made of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood, which are completely inert, they cannot see, hear, or walk. When we look at what is described in Revelation about people's responses to tremendous disasters, it is quite shocking to see that many did not change their attitudes. Even with devastating plagues knocking at the door, many continued with their old habits, murders, sorceries, thefts, and all kinds of sexual immorality. It's that moment when you think, seriously? With all this happening, why not seek a change, ask for mercy? This resistance to repentance is very reminiscent of the story of Pharaoh in Egypt. Even after his country was hit by a series of catastrophic plagues, he remained firm, refusing to relent and release the Israelites. This stubbornness ultimately led to his downfall. Similarly, in Revelation, instead of turning to God for help or forgiveness, many people simply hardened their hearts even more. This makes us reflect on how sometimes we resist recognizing when we are wrong or need to change. It's like butting heads with reality without gaining anything from it. History shows that this stubbornness brings nothing good, it only prolongs suffering and prevents healing. This idea of fighting against God, without any plausible reason, helps no one, it's a lost battle before it even begins. This passage invites us to think about our own lives, are we open to change when facing challenges, or do we close ourselves off, refusing to accept help and change our ways? It's a good reflection on the importance of being open to transformations, especially when we are going through difficult times. As we study the prophecies of the apocalypse, a theme clearly stands out, even in the face of clear signs of divine judgment, many nations and their peoples continue to defy God. Incredibly, instead of seeking forgiveness and reconciliation with the Creator, these individuals choose the path of rebellion, even going so far as to blaspheme the name of God. It's a shocking situation, a true choice for darkness over light. 
This pattern of resistance and refusal to repent has grave consequences. Without repentance, these individuals are heading towards even greater suffering and, unfortunately, eternal condemnation. It makes us pause and reflect on the importance of being open to change and recognizing when we are wrong. So, how about we take this moment for a reflective pause? It's time to look inward and evaluate our own attitudes. We all can be stubborn at times, especially when facing challenges or feeling pressured. But are we letting our pride and arrogance blind us to the need for change? Let's take this opportunity to reflect and pray. Let's ask God to show us where we are going wrong and to give us strength to truly repent. May this reflection help us align our lives with the values of love, compassion, and justice that God desires for us. May we learn not only to seek forgiveness but also to live in a way that reflects that forgiveness in our daily lives. Thank you very much for watching the video until the end. Please leave a like on the video, subscribe to the channel, and turn on notifications to be notified when we post a new video.